Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette in our mini-series on cologne and fragrances. In today's part one, we discuss the history of cologne. In part two, we talk about how to pick the right cologne for you, as well as how to apply it. And part three is about do's and don'ts. <laughs> There are entire YouTube channels and websites solely dedicated to cologne and fragrances. Last time I checked, smell of vision wasn't a thing of reality, so it may come as a bit of a surprise. At the same time, the fragrance you choose can be a defining component of your style and who you are in the perception of others. Unlike your clothes, cologne can leave a long-lasting, non-visual impression. However, it can also be very subjective, and so we thought it was a good idea to create a mini-series on cologne and fragrances. Of course, I'll also share with you what I use and for what reasons and at what time during the day and during what season. So first of all, let's talk about the history. Cologne has been around since the old days of Mesopotamia and Egypt. It was quite rudimentary at the time, but essentially was considered to be a part of alchemy. The first perfumier was a person known as Taputi. By using distilled flowers, oils, and other aromatics, Taputi was able to create the first kind of perfume, which is similar to what we know today. By the ninth century, the book of chemistry of perfume was written by the Arab Al-Kindi. Later on, a Persian chemist by the name of Ibn Sina experimented with extracting oils from flowers by distilling them, particularly roses. Perfume was introduced to Europe during the medieval period. It would take until the 14th century until Hungarians created the first alcohol-based perfume. At this time, perfumes or fragrances were only available to the very, very rich, and they were usually used to mask the odors on the streets. At that time, there was no common septic system or sewer system in the cities. So typically, a gentleman or a lady would apply cologne onto their handkerchief, hold it in front of their nose as they would walk down the smelly streets. At the time, perfumes were so desirable and therefore expensive that the laboratories would only often be reachable by secret passageways to avoid stealing. So why is Cologne called Cologne? Actually, it dates back to the German city of Cologne, which in German is actually called Köln. In 1709, the Italian native Giovanni Maria Farina, who had emigrated to Cologne, invented the first perfume as we know it today. He named his creation Eau de Cologne, which means as much as water of Cologne, in order to pay homage to his new hometown. It was popular at the time and became known as Aqua Mirabilis, which means as much as miracle water. A single vial of that stuff sold for half the annual salary of a public servant in Germany at the time. Quite a bit, isn't it? It was believed to be a fountain of youth, and doctors even encouraged their patients to drink it. During the 19th century, there were disputes about the name of Farina, and eventually the Eau de Cologne 4711 was created towards the end of the 19th century. It's still around today in the supposedly same recipe, and you can buy it everywhere. Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of it, but ever since that day, Eau de Cologne has been around to denote a form of fragrance. What is cologne today? On the one hand, it means any kind of fragrance for men. On the other hand, the term Eau de Cologne is used to determine the aromatics portions of a fragrance. For example, traditionally, colognes or perfumes would contain 20 to 30 or 40 percent of flavor components. Today, Eau de Parfum, also known as EDP, usually has about 15 to 20 percent. Eau de Toilette usually has 10 to 15 percent of aromatics, and Eau de Cologne has anywhere from 2 to 4 or sometimes 3 to 8 percent, and Eau Fraiche is just 1 to 3 percent. So in the scheme of things, Eau de Cologne is actually not quite desirable anymore. You'd rather want to go with Eau de Parfum. So if there are only so few aromatics in Cologne, what's the rest of it? Basically, when you read the ingredients, you oftentimes see aqua, which means as much as distilled water, nothing else. Other parts are basically ethanol, which is alcohol, because it evaporates quickly, but it helps to stabilize the scent. On top of that, you can usually find other stabilizers, such as benzoic acid or phthalates. In fact, 70% of all consumer fragrances on the market today contain the phthalate DEP. Some people are concerned about it because DHP and other phthalates are 
known to be not good for your health. However, in the case of DEP, there's no evidence that it has a negative impact on you or your health, at least not at this point. Usually, one than less percent of a flacon are DEP. At the same time, they're not listed on the ingredients list, which personally I find quite concerning because as a consumer, I'd rather like to know what's in it and what is not so I can make a decision by myself. Another common stabilizer is beeswax, but it's usually something you find in solid forms such as scented candles. So if you read beeswax, it doesn't mean that it's particularly natural or anything. It's a common stabilizer in the industry. All right, now that you know the historic basics of cologne, let's move on to part two about how to pick the cologne that's right for you and how to apply it. Want to know what I'm wearing today? Stay tuned for the outfit description in part three.